Alrighty. Welcome back to Wordy Wednesdays. I'm your intrepid narrator, Fragath, and uh, today we're um, we're cheating a little and uh, doing the finale and wrap up of um, the Mobile Suit Gundam novelization today because I am not going to be around next Monday. I was unsure this previous Monday whether that would be the case, and I have since had it confirmed I am not going to be around, um, at least not in any practical capacity. Uh, this is a fairly short one anyway. Um, it is not very long, uh, and it is just the, the finale, the conclusion of the novel. Uh, I am sorry to all my Mecha Mondays exclusive listeners. Um, I'll have it in the uh, I'll have it in the playlist. I realize that not having a social media account makes this uh, kind of difficult, but uh, it's in the stream description, and I'll have it in the proper playlist. So it'll all sort itself out in the end. Yay! Um, so I'm sorry about this, but uh, here it is. Them's the breaks. Uh, it helps that uh, I've always kind of couched Wednesdays as sort of my float day. Uh, I'll use it if I need to for something. That's how it started, uh, as I was using it to double up on uh, Hyperion reading so we could bang through the first book quickly and keep a uh, sane pacing, because um, there were interludes in that, and I'd use Wednesdays for the short interlude, or as it turns out, they wound up being the long ones, <laughs> by and large, <laughs> the actual non-interlude portions, but it, it happens. So I'm having to do it again here. Um, stuff like that will happen again in future, I'm sure. Um, Unless, of course, I decide to go through with my grand master plan, um, my master of the eight trigrams pole fighter plan. Um, truly genius bronze monk, Shaolin bronzeman um, plan, uh, and turn Wednesdays into something a little bit different for at least a while. Um, but we'll see. Uh, for now, though, this is the conclusion to uh, Yoshiyuki Tomino's Mobile Suit Gundam novelization, uh, all three parts, Awakening, Escalation, and Confrontation. This is the last bit of that latter one. Uh, and previously on, our protagonist is dead. Not just dead, like super dead, like perma-dead, uh, blown up, like he's not coming back from the swamp dead. <laughs> uh, as is Hayato Kobayashi, which is a crying shame. Um, he did nothing wrong, other than not be the protagonist, but of course, as we can see here, being the protagonist is uh, not a guarantee of survival. Um... So, with that, though, in his death throes, um, Amro sends out basically a giant new type empathic signal telling basically everyone in the area who can receive such signals, hey, we need to get together with Char, uh, we need to go and take care of Giran, and then take care of Jabiro, because we've got to root out the corruption everywhere, and that's the only way we'll ever have a hope. So things are a bit different now, <laughs> extensively different um, from the original animated series um, and the movies, for that matter, the movie trilogy, um, which mostly is the same as the TV series, but it uh, cuts a bunch of stuff out, um, which is a shame because some of the stuff it cuts out is actually pretty good. Um, I feel adds depth and uh, a little more texture, but I can understand why people would suggest them over the series. It is very well. The movie trilogy is very well animated. Anyway, uh, with that, um, we're going to get cracking. I think that's basically everything. Um, oh yeah, and Chalia Bull died because he was like, hey, let me psychically yell at this person who just saw like a million people die. I'm sure he'll be fine. <laughs> like, and then by the end he's like, oh man, I goofed. 
And uh, the the best part is Amro, or the worst part is Amro is killed by like a complete literal who who we've had like three interactions with in the book up until now. And of course, he has the same reaction at the end of it all that Amro did the the time he killed um, Lala and Cusco Al, which is my God, what have I done? Um, I'm smiling, but it's horrible. It's 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 very tragic, but it's you know it's it's perfectly done. Okay, so let's get rocking and rolling. Uh, this will be relatively short, still beefy, but uh, relatively short. And again, I'm sorry that it's having to go down like this. <laughs> it is it is not what I would have chosen in an ideal world, but we are getting through it nonetheless. And uh, the practical upshot is I'll be able to move on to whatever I'm going to move on to next for Mecha Mondays uh, sooner. Well, at about the same time, actually. So not sooner. Okay. With that, sit back, relax, uh, still have some intense stuff coming up, but um, this is this is pretty much the anti-climax here, um, so things are going to be a bit smoother, but, you know, strap yourself in, have a sip from your little uh, zero-G space cup, and, uh, and enjoy. Chapter 23, Zum City. Zum City derived its name from the late Zion Zum Dekun's middle name, and served as the principality of Zion's capital, its military, political, and administrative center. The port sector of the giant sealed cylinder colony held the branch offices of the Secret Service, whose personnel worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Customs and Immigration Authorities. Looking out a giant window in his office, Lieutenant Rambaral could clearly see Mahal, some 180 kilometers in the distance. The work shifts on the immigration check were not scheduled to change yet, but he had to put a stop to inspections of embarking passengers two hours earlier. He and the dozen men in his command all knew Mahal was about to fire, and they watched and waited with bated breath. It's time. Before Rambaral finished his sentence, an enormous flare of light burst out of the end of the distant cylinder. The entire colony, six kilometers wide and thirty kilometers long, had been turned into a giant laser cannon, but the flare had come from the residual matter in the cylinder that had incinerated on ignition. The actual laser beam itself was invisible. Nonetheless, despite a five-layer window with built-in filters, Ramba and his men were overwhelmed by the intensity of light. One of the younger men exclaimed nervously, If that thing were aimed at the moon, it'd blow it out of the sky! And that's not even at full power! Another marveled. The Federation attack on Abo Aku's proceeding too fast, Ramba calmly said. That's why they had to use it. Then the vid phone next to him rang, and he grabbed the receiver. This is the communications division of the 58th Battalion of the System Project. Admiral Chapman Jerome has a message for you and your men in the SS. The second blast will take place 20 minutes from now. Until it is over, you are ordered to stop any and all ships leaving Zum City. Instructions understood, Ramba replied. The men around him who overheard the interchange suddenly began whispering among themselves. That was a test. They say the next blast's for real. That means the war is over, right? Twenty minutes from now. Ramba pressed a button to lower the shutters on the outside wall of windows, turned around, and strolled over to pick up a coffee tube from a machine in the corner of the room. So this is what the Supreme Commander meant by settling this thing for once and for all, he thought. He could understand Girin's mindset, but at the same time he was worried about Crowley. 
He knew the first blast had missed her, but there was a strong possibility the second would not. The real question was how Kaecilia would interpret and react to whatever information Crowley had brought her. Her life's hanging in the balance, he concluded, unless she can get away from the front lines or unless Revel changes his strategy. Ramba rarely thought about the fact that Girin Zabi might be suspicious of Crowley's activities. He knew it was possible, but never lost any sleep over it. And as for himself, his integrity and fatalistic attitude ultimately formed a veil that even Girin's secretary, Cecil Cecilia Irene, was unable to see through. He was the type of man who served his master loyally no matter what. And it was not a charade. He simply had no idea that the little seed he had planted in Crowley's mind might eventually cause Girin's death. Crowley Hamon was already working on another, more independent level. Oh, thanks for tuning in, Warren Steele. No, no, no. Take your time to catch up. <laughs> don't, uh, definitely, don't speed ahead or spoil, your, spoil yourself on my account. Take your time to enjoy it as best you can. As voices echoed through the Zum City Joint Command Operations Room during the technical check, Giran Zabi found he enjoyed watching the tension building on the faces of those around him. Pictures from observation satellites already indicated the test blast had achieved everything he had hoped for. The Mahal Colony Cylinder, in its new role as a laser oscillator, had performed exactly as designed. Only half the energy supplied by the solar batteries installed in the area around the colony had been used. It would not even be necessary to wait another twenty minutes for the next blast. Suddenly, a terminal in front of Girin indicated a problem, and several technicians dashed up and gathered before it. "'What's this?' he demanded. Two faulty microcircuits?' He knew any equipment put in place so rapidly was likely to develop some problems. They were also in an area that was not entirely devoid of Minovsky particles, and there was bound to be some interference. But at least the effectiveness of the system had been proven. The Federation Armada was part of Earth's last-ditch effort, and if the Armada could be annihilated, it would inevitably mean the defeat of the Earth Federation. And if, in the process of ending the war, he could el also eliminate his sister on Aboaku, it would be like bagging two birds with one stone. Captain Hasibi, Hasebe, of the Engineers' Corps, was standing in front of him with his back turned. "'Well, Captain?' Girin casually asked. Hasebe spun around and said in a strained voice, "'We can do the job at seventy-eight percent of power, Excellency, but the surviving Federation forces seem to be regrouping slowly, sir. I think it's still too early to fire again.' Girin turned to a general staff officer standing behind him to his left. "'Do you agree?' he asked. "'Yes, sir,' the, the officer replied. "'The forces under Vice Admiral Randolph Vigelman's command, and also those of Her, Excellent, Her Excellency Kaecilia Zabi, are gradually closing in on the enemy, sir. If we fire the cannon now, the losses to our own forces will be enormous.' I suggest that using it immediately is out of the question, but I think we might win anyway. Don't ever use the word might in front of me, officer, Girin suddenly hissed. Sorry, don't ever use the word might in front of me, officer, Girin suddenly hissed. Yes, sir, beg your pardon, Excellency, the man apologized. You don't think we should just sit back and watch, do you? No, sir, not at all, sir. Good, Girin replied calmly. He had just decided to wait another two or three minutes before making his final decision, when one of his aides in the room announced, Admiral Chapman Jerome's on the hotline, sir. Chapman hopefully wasn't going to create a problem, Girin thought. The man was starting to grate on his nerves. 
The console in front of him was reserved for the commanding officer of the operations center, and it had a special box built into it with a secure comm line for confidential conversations. He lifted the lid on the box and took out a bright red receiver, whereupon an image appeared on the display directly above it, showing Chapman standing at attention holding a similar receiver. In ten minutes we'll be ready for the second blast, Excellency. We await your decision on timing and the, uh, final target. Oh, sorry. In ten minutes we'll be ready for the second blast, Excellency. We await your decision on the timing and the, uh, final target. Chapman's voice was low and restrained, as if he were afraid someone would overhear him. Girin wished he were more forthright. I've decided to wait a few minutes and see how things develop, Chapman, but there'll be no change in the final target. As soon as we fire up the laser cannon, we'll also start strafing on the zig line as planned. Yes, sir, Chapman sal answered, saluting. We'll say it was an accident. Understand, Chapman? An accident. I'll let you know as soon as I decide. Girin was trying to be easy on the man, but wondered if it, was a, if it were a mistake. Perhaps he should have been more firm. Nothing was going to affect the situation very much at this point. As long as it appeared Revel was going to reach Abo Aku, then the Space Fortress would be included in the attack. Even if the Federation Armada had been dealt a nearly fatal blow with the first blast, e and even if Revel's forces had dispersed or retreated, oh, excuse me, he would still have carried out the strafing operation. It just would have been a little harder to come up with a plausible excuse to justify it. Revel, in his desperation, was now making things easier for him. Revel's an awfully determined bastard, that's all I can say, he mused aloud. It's quite possible, Excellency, an aide replied, that he was killed in the first firing. It certainly would make sense to assume so. What makes you say that? Girin suddenly demanded. Any normal fleet admiral would have turned tail and run right after being fired upon by a laser cannon of that magnitude. The Federation Armada's plowing ahead precisely because Revel's still in command. He's probably trying to reach Abo Aku to use it as a shield. Don't forget, sometimes in war a bull-headed approach is the key to victory. Using Abo Aku as a shield? The aide, along with the other staff members in the operations room, had never thought of that possibility. Suddenly, he felt new respect for his leader. The feeling was not mutual, however. Girin loathed signs of weakness among his men. He looked up at the giant overhead operations display on which they relied so heavily. It wasn't radar-based and was only a computer simulation generated from unreliable laser sensor readings. Hmm, he thought, and they believe in this junk. An official-sounding voice echoed from the operation room speakers. Five minutes left until the second firing. Countdown now commencing. Good, Girin grunted, reaching again for the hotline receiver to contact Chapman and inform him of his decision. Then he heard a shout behind him and turned around. The Federation forces have what? An excited officer was exclaiming. What's going on? Girin demanded. There seems to have been a change, Excellency. Are you sure? We're double-checking right now, sir. There had been no change in the operations display. It took time for information from laser sensors to be analyzed and extrapolated, and physical interference from Minovsky particles often blocked and distorted much of the data that did, not, that did arrive. Sorry. Countdown stopped. Countdown on hold. Ignition on standby. Girin put the hotline receiver back in its box and closed the lid. Then he spun his chair around to better see what was going on in the center of the operations room. On a special holoscopic monitor that generated a 3D image with coordinate lines for reference, computer data from a dozen regular terminals throughout the room was being collected and displayed. As Girin watched, scores of red and green lights, used to differentiate friendly from enemy craft, began to wink on and off.
Sorry about that. It does appear, Excellency, one of the staff officers announced, that the Federation forces are detouring to get around onto the other side of Aboaku. There's an 82% probability they're using it as a shield. It was a mystery to Girin how anyone in his right mind could put so much faith in numerical projections. Those who believed in such a sophisticated form of speculation, he concluded, were idiots. They lacked, he reminded himself, they lacked, he reminded himself, the very quality he so prided himself on, an acute sensitivity to the complexity of the issues at hand. And that thought helped him make his next decision. Order all Aboaku ships to leave the area along the Geldorva line, he announced. Restart the solar ray countdown, now. Everything was going according to plan. His mind began to turn to ways of wrapping up business after the war was finally concluded. If I threatened to decelerate Luna 2 and make it crash on their heads, he thought, the idiots underground in Jabiro would probably give up. But maybe that won't even be necessary. Girin grabbed the hotline receiver once more, and Chapman's image immediately appeared on the dedicated monitor. Chapman here, sir! Good, Chapman. We'll proceed as planned. Then, in a low voice, he confirmed the true target. I want you to strafe from Geldorva all the way to the Zig Line of Fire. As planned. Repeat. As planned. On the monitor screen, Chapman's eyes appeared to be closed. Yes, sir, he replied softly. Girin slammed the receiver down and immediately grabbed another. Give me Lieutenant Rambaral of the SS immediately, he barked to the comm officer. Uh, Lieutenant Rambaral appearing on screen, sir, the officer announced. Girin waited a second and then spoke. Lieutenant, this is your supreme commander. I want you to be ready to leave immediately for Mahal. Wait in the port area till I give you your next orders. Yes, sir. Ramba's eager response made Girin feel mild disgust. The man was destined to spend the rest of his life in a pathetic attempt to make amends for the fact that his father, Jim Baral, had fled the principality with the children of Zion Zun Dekun. From the moment the solar ray system reached maximum power for the second blast, the staff officers in operations had held their breath in anticipation. They knew the Federation fleet was being targeted, but none of them knew what Girin had just secretly ordered Chapman to do. Thirty seconds remaining. Twenty-seven. Twenty-five. Twenty-three. To Girin's surprise, the final countdown was perform. Oh, jeez. Thirty seconds remaining. Twenty-seven. Twenty-five. Twenty-three. To Girin's surprise, the final countdown was performed with the computer-simulated voice of an attractive young woman. Someone, probably Chapman, had apparently decided a female voice would register better on his ears. It was a nice touch, but it irritated him. It made him think that his men were trying too hard to please him, perhaps out of fear. He shut his eyes and contemplated a more serious matter. Don't worry, Kaecilia, he thought. When the solar ray cannon hits Aboaku, you won't feel a thing. Even if you're in the most sheltered, protected part of the fortress, the whole process will only take a few seconds. Then you'll rest in peace. The real problem will be what to do with our father, the Sovereign. The countdown continued. Three, two, one. Filters were activated on all monitors in the room linked to Mahal. And then the laser cannon fired with a thwoosh. It was clearly a more powerful blast than the first.
A colossal flare of light suddenly appeared around the opening as an invisible laser beam again split the heavens. The same instant, Chapman, in the Mahal Control Center on the Guild, turned the switch to ignite 58, 58 thruster rockets on the top side of the colony cylinder. Fire jets 98 through 156. Number 98 has fired. 100 through 110 have fired. 110 through 20 have fired. In Zum City, in the background on his secure hotline monitor, Girin could hear the personnel in charge of adjusting the Mahal firing angle relay. Oh, jeez. That's a long sentence. In Zum City, in the background, in the background, on his secure hotline monitor, Girin could hear the personnel in charge of adjusting the Mahal firing angle relay their commands through the center, linking up the system. Chapman, after his orders had been conveyed, looked ashen. Only a few men in his command were capable of understanding the basic operation of the laser cannon and its retargeting mechanism, and most had no time to question what they were doing. Those who had doubts probably were too tense to vocalize them, or so stunned by the magnitude of the giant flare of light that they never even noticed the correction in the firing angle. The staff in the operations room of the Joint Command Headquarters at Zoom City were the first to detect it, and the cry went up, Change in angle! Mahal now switching to Zig line of fire! In the operations room of the Guild... The officer in charge of trajectory, that's the name of the ship, sorry, <laughs> it's italicized. The officer in charge of trajectory was the first to protest to Admiral Chapman Jerome. Firing any jets over number 140, sir, will make us deviate from the gal door of a line. We've got to stop immediately. What? Chapman screamed. Who gave you permission to fire over 140? You say they've already fired? Stop the procedure instantly! Use reverse thrust and return the cylinder at once to position on the Geldorva line! It was a masterpiece of acting. It was already too late to execute his request, for over ten seconds had already elapsed since he had hit the switch. The giant colony's inertia was far too great to stop suddenly. The hotline phone in front of Chapman rang. Chapman, this is Girin. What's going on? Mahal's angle of fire is skewed. Are you trying to fry Abo a coup? We're working on the problem, Excellency. The laser oscillation is ceased, but... but... Chapman answered with as loud and as panicked a voice as Girin. In reality, he was overjoyed. The deception had worked. He and Girin Zabi were carrying out a little charade that no one else was privy to. He congratulated himself. The Supreme Commander and I are co-conspirators. Co Girin ordered the hotline phone with Chapman disconnected. He knew the giant laser beam should have incinerated most of the Earth Federation forces and melted the stem of Abo Aku. As far as he was concerned, the operation was over. He next contacted Lieutenant Rambaral, about to leave the Zum City port for the Mahal area. Ramba, this is Girin. I want you to proceed directly to the Guild. Someone changed the laser cannon's angle of fire. I want you to find out who's responsible and arrest them. If anyone resists, execute them on the spot. That's an order. Sir? On the monitor, Lieutenant Rambaral appeared confused, as did the other officers in the operations room who overheard. Someone shifted the Mahal cylinder, so its line of fire included the S sector of Abo Aku. I'm worried about my sister Kaecilia. If anything has happened to her, I'm holding Ca Admiral Cap I'm holding Admiral Chapman Jerome personally accountable, even if it was an accident. I want you to deal with him. Do you understand me, Ramba? Y y yes, sir. Supreme Commander, sir. 
Without bothering to watch Ramba salute, Girin turned to his aides and ordered, I want a survey done of, on the level of damage to Abo Aku right away, and the results conveyed to Lieutenant Ramba Rao. He was secretly thrilled. Here he was, impersonating himself in an elaborate charade and doing such an excellent job. I also want to know how extensive the Federation losses are, he added with just the right tone. We can't be too careful. Then Girin sat back in the upholstered chair provided him and thought, Now I'll wait to see how well my plan really worked. For some reason, he suddenly began thinking of Cecilia and her curvaceous form. Several minutes before the Mahal laser cannon fired its second blast, chaos erupted in the operations room on the Federation Armada's flagship, Drog. The Pegasus II had paved the way for the Federation vanguard by weakening the bottom of Abo Aku's defensive perimeter, and with a little more effort, the lead ships might have been able to smash through and land on the stem of the fortress itself. But now something bizarre was happening. Scouts had detected odd movements in the Principality defenders, seemingly unrelated to the Federation attack. And the cryptic communication received from Pegasus II was even more puzzling. The graying fleet admirals and staff officers around General Revel argued bitterly over its meaning and whether it meant they should change their strategy. The word from Pegasus II is that Girin Zabi is planning to eliminate a few of his own forces too. That's preposterous. I want to know where that information comes from. I don't care how fanatical Giran Zabi is, I simply refuse to believe he destroys his own crack units. Is this some sort of no-type intuition, or are we dealing with fortune tellers? How could we possibly act on unconfirmed information and give up all we've gained? The staff officers debated furiously, knowing the success of the entire campaign depended on their correct interpretation of the situation. They tried to be as rational and objective as possible, but lacking concrete information, they were ultimately reduced to speculating. And since they were staring directly into the maw of death, every minute spent on discussion was a minute squandered. General Revel finally stood up and raised his hands to silence his agitated officers. Gentlemen, he announced, I've given your op opinions careful consideration. Debates have their time and place, but we've wasted precious minutes, and now we need a decision. A hush fell over the room, and the men turned toward him. I've decided we should immediately abandon our position and proceed in the direction of the Pegasus II, as in the direction that the Pegasus II has indicated. Each fleet will continue to fire at the enemy, but reverse course and disperse. After we've avoided the next laser cannon blast, we can immediately regroup again. This order is effective immediately, and I want it, to, I want it transmitted to all units. On the double! Sir... Asked the calm officer, uh, is radio transmission acceptable? Anything, Revel barked angrily. Just get the message out, immediately. He waited until the man made his way through the cluster of staff officers to the comm console, and then ordered the drog captain. Put Abo Aku between us and the sun, and immediately reverse course. The drog bridge sprang to life, and the ship's prow started turning around, while the upper and lower deck twin megaparticle cannons maintained a constant barrage on the stem of Abo Aku. The rest of the armada also began to react as soon as it received its new orders from the flagship. Three Chivet-class heavy cruisers came up on the drog's port side, nearly grazing its prow, and joined in an intense barrage. Squadrons of Federation Flying Manta fighters plunged into melees with their Xeon Gatl counterparts in front of the ships. And when a nearby gym suit was hit, fragments from the explosion rained on the Drog's bridge. 
what Revel and his staff officers feared most appeared to be coming true. The Armada was like a giant with legs of clay, trying to turn on a dime. Disarray was already appearing in the ranks. With its weaknesses exposed and nearly surrounded by the enemy, the Armada was attempting a maneuver normally considered madness in space warfare. With a worried look, Revel glanced at a computer-simulated combat status display. Oh, sorry. With a worried look, Revel glanced at computer-simulated combat status displays on either side of him. Well, he asked the officer in charge, any sign of Xeon forces breaking through our lines? No, sir. Their rear guard seems to have begun to disperse, sir. I don't know what it means, though. Suddenly, they were interrupted by the comm tech. Sir, we've intercepted a communication from Xeon. It looks like an order's gone out for all fleets on the Geldorva line to retreat. The Geldorva line? Can you tell what course they're on? No, sir. Sorry, sir. Revel was puzzled. Why was the Principality issuing an order to retreat? And why all fleets? There was no evidence they had done so earlier, before the first laser cannon blast had occurred. There was no way he could have known the order was merely Giran Zabi's sop to his own conscience, conscience, a too late attempt to atone for his diabolical plot. This is odd, Revel muttered. And then it happened. Thousands of flashes occurred to the rear of both forces, turning the area into chaos, and an enormous ring of light spread out toward the core of the Earth Federation Armada. The final image that registered on General Revel's retina was that of the stem portion of Zeon's Aboaku space fortress turning white-hot and melting. Then his flesh and blood turned into dust and scattered into a jet-black cosmos. In the command center atop the giant Aboaku fortress, Vice Admiral Randolph Vigelman's last words were a scream. Mein Gott! Have the men on Mahal lost their minds? Along with a third of his men, he had survived the initial attack, but after the fortress stem disintegrated, the entire superstructure began to shudder, sending him ricocheting between the floor and ceiling a dozen times, snapping his neck and killing him instantly. Others were killed in the weightless conditions when ordinary machinery and equipment became deadly projectiles. Then Abo Aku heaved mightily and exploded, spewing rock and metal fragments into space. The Earth Federation space armada had been destroyed. Zeon's forces had been crippled, for Giran Zabi had sacrificed many of his best units and people and a strategically vital final defense outpost. The war, to all appearances, had virtually ended but reality was not so simple. Unbeknownst to Giran Zabi, his sister Kaecilia had survived the attack on Aboaku and was making a beeline for Zeon's heartland in the Swamel accompanied by two heavy and three light cruisers. At secondary combat distance, she was also followed by the Pegasus II and a pair of Federation Salamis-class cruisers. The shortest route normally took less than two hours, and after seeing what the solar ray laser cannon had done to Aboaku, Kaecilia ordered her engineers to wring every ounce of speed possible out of her ship. On the bridge, one of her aides announced... There seems to be no doubt, Excellency, that the S sector of the fortress was targeted. Like the other officers, he was still incredulous, and, being well aware of his superior's tendency for blind rages, he trembled to think what she might attempt for revenge. Kaecilia assembled her crew and addressed them, 
I'm asking you to join me on a new and dangerous mission. This is not an order, but a request. Those of you who disagree with what I'm about to do are free to leave this ship. I will even provide one of the cruisers for your safe passage. You may surrender to the Federation, or, when, ma when all is over, return to Zeon. All I ask is that you do not interfere with my plans. The assembled officers and men waited nervously, wondering what she would say next. I've decided to use whatever force I have at my disposal to destroy the supreme commander of the Principality, Giran Zabi. For your information, Commander Shah Raznable has agreed to join me. I await your decision. Kaecilia knew that few of her crew would oppose her. She had, after all, just saved their lives. If not for her, they would have been roasted in the solar ray blast. And besides, she had the support of Shar Aznable and the 300th Autonomous. While small in number, they were reputed to be the Principality's most powerful unit of all. After a few moments of deliberation, Captain Forsyth, representing all those assembled on the bridge, stepped up to Kaecilia. Excellency, he said, the votes is unanimous. Some of us have questions, but we've all decided to cast our lot with you. Good, she answered. Just for your information, we also have a Federation Trojan horse and two Salamis-class cruisers following us. They're on our side. On our side? You mean they're helpers? That's correct, Forsyth. Then one of the younger officers blurted out in disbelief, But, but why? The Earth Federation Space Force, Kaecilia explained, has, for all intents and purposes, been destroyed. These surviving ships are virtual orphans in the area, and their only real chance for survival is to follow us to Zeon and surrender. When they realize the horror of what Girin Zabi has really done, they decided to join us and try to eliminate him. But, Excellency... The officer continued, apoplectic in his questioning. How can you be sure? We still don't know exactly what happened. The damage to Abo Aku must have been the result of some sort of accident on Mahal. How can you unilaterally conclude we must eliminate the Supreme Commander? Kaecilia was suddenly seized by an impulse to scream at the man for his stupidity. Because I know my own brother, Supreme Commander Girin Zabi, deleberately targeted Abo Aku's S Sector in an attempt to kill me. That's why. The Supreme Commander tried to kill your Excellency? My voice doesn't go that high. <laughs> the young man was incredulous as a new reality sank in. He and the other officers in the room had long heard rumors of Zabi family intrigues, and now they at last knew. Tell me one other thing, though, he ventured to ask. How did the enemy ship, the Trojan horse, know what was going on? I don't know myself, Kaecilia replied, glancing at Captain Forsyth. As you all know, Commander Shah Raznable's recent battle report was extremely vague. She knew it was possible that Shah had been in secret communication with the Federation White Base class ship all along, but she doubted it. If he had been passing highly detailed information about her plans, she was certain it would have fled the area or turned around and attacked her squadron. She suspected something far more subtle was going on, something beyond her immediate comprehension. Her suspicions had been reinforced earlier with the verification of the Gundam mobile suit's destruction. Around the same time Shar Aznable's report stated that the destruction had occurred, she had mysteriously heard the words, Destroy Garen! It was almost as if they had suddenly slipped into her mind, and at the time she had even wondered if they were a figment of her imagination. 
But then she remembered the few times she had heard Char, she had heard Char talk about his experiences in battle with new types. She herself knew little about them, and merely assumed they had a slightly more evolved consciousness. But if the pilot of the Gundam were a true new type, and she herself had some of the same potential, then, she realized, she actually might have received some message from him. It was a tiny revelation, but it had swayed her. I believe, she continued, it has something to do with the fact that they are a new type unit. I think they've joined us because they intuitively know Giran Zabi is an enemy, not just of the Federation, but of all mankind. Even after we just destroyed the Gundam MS? Forsyth asked, still doubting. The Gundam pilot wasn't their only new type. Their gu the Gundam pilot wasn't their only new type, Kaecilia snapped, irritated. As far as I can tell, new types aren't supermen, but ordinary people with a unique sensitivity or awareness. They're people capable of seeing the totality of things. I'm sure there's more than one new type aboard that ship, and I'm sure that's why they've decided to join us. So now they're our comrades in arms. <laughs> I don't like the sound of comrades, fl frankly. Think of them as temporary allies. But enough talk. I want all crew members to stay at their posts, but try to rest. But to try and rest. When we approach Zoom City, we'll probably encounter resistance. We'll assume battle formation as soon as we reach the third combat line. Kaecilia ended the session with a final exhortation to her troops, her shrill voice echoing throughout the bridge of the Swamel. On the bridge of the Pegasus II, Bright Noah and the core crew members greeted an unusual visitor. "'We bear you no personal grudge, Commander Kshar Asnable,' Bright said. "'If we'd stayed in the area, we would have all been vaporized.' It irritated him that he couldn't see the man's eyes clearly behind his protective mask. I am relieved to see, I am relieved to hear that, Shar answered stiffly, especially from the skipper of such a distinguished warship. It's a profound honor for me to be here, and as you know, it's not a mere accident. Frankly, without Amaro Ray, it never would have been possible, and without you and your crew, Amaro Ray would never have been able to develop his potential to the extent that he did. Sela continued to man the comm console on the bridge, but she could see and hear everything going on. Only a few steps away from her, standing with impeccable bearing, was her brother, tall and magnificent, with a warm voice, resplendent in his red Xeon military uniform, with his protective mask and platinum-colored helmet. His personal charisma was already helping to put the Pegasus crew at ease. Yet as she watched him discuss strategies with her skipper, she knew he had changed. He was her brother Casvaldekun, yet he was also Commander Shar Asnable of the Principality of Zeon Military, and the latter persona had by now nearly eclipsed the former. As much as she wanted to get up out of her seat and run to him, she couldn't. Her brother was a memory a memory treasured by her own other persona, Artesia Dekun, which was also fading within her. Amaro had been right, and his words now helped her stay in control, helped her prepare for the inevitable parting she knew she would again experience. He killed the man I loved, she thought. As she watched, Kai Shiden extended his hand in greeting to Shar. I'm the gun cannon pilot, Commander. Kai said, and I'm sorry, but I'm not the forgiven type. Some day you may have to pay a price. I understand, but remember that the situation's changing and that there's a time and place for everything. Right now, all I ask is that you don't shoot me in the back until we get through this mess. Slegger Law answered for Kai. It's a deal, Commander, but after it's all over, we may demand as they say, satisfaction. Fine, 
Shar replied with a crooked smile at Slegger, Kai, and Bright. That'll give me something to look forward to. Here's hoping we survive. We all survive till then. Then Mirai stepped forward. If we're going to be allies, she said, I've got one favor to ask. There's something that still makes me feel uncomfortable around you. Uncomfortable? Yes, that weird mask. Why do you always wear it? This thing? Shar said, taken aback. It's a sort of personal statement, you might say, a trademark. Then, without hesitating, he doffed his helmet, handed it to Slegger, and casually removed the mask. Sorry to keep wearing it, he said with a shy grin. It was just hard to break an old habit. Bright extended his right hand and said, Allies, Commander Shar Asnable. Allies. Shar took his hand and in a soft voice answered, I want to believe in the communion among people that Amaro believed in. Then let's work toward it then, Commander. Char spotted Sela and immediately walked over to her. He stopped in front of her and looked straight at her. Sela looked up. Her brother's arms seemed to be inviting her ever so subtly. A rush of childhood memories surged through her body, and she embraced him gently. Artesia, Char said, can you forgive me? Amaro was young, Casval, and I loved him. Char bent down and looked at her closely, his chin brushing against her blonde hair. That's all I wanted to know, he said, because we may never meet again. I know, she replied, pulling away from him. She wasn't crying. She simply felt the Artesia persona within her becoming weaker and weaker. Just try and stay out of trouble, she said. Char chuckled at her subtle humor. You've grown quite a sense of... <laughs> You've grown into quite a woman, sister. You've grown into quite a woman, sister. There we go. Sela smiled back at him, and then noticed the rest of the crew members staring at them with an embarrassed look, like spectators at an intimate interchange. Shar turned and spoke to the assembled crew. Petty Officer First Class Sela Mass, he said, is my sister, Artesia Dacon. She's my only sister, and she will always be my sister. He then bent over, kissed Sela on the cheek, and put his mask back on. And Casval Rem Dacon once again disappeared behind it. When Lieutenant Rambaral arrived on the battleship Guild, he was accompanied by thirty members of the Zeon Secret Service. He immediately, confronted the mil he immediately confronted the military men in the Operations Command Center of the System Project. We have instructions to arrest all those responsible for skewering Mahal's angle of fire, he announced. Everyone here is a suspect. A chorus of voices rose in protest. But, but we were just following orders. You can't arrest us for that. The Admiral specifically ordered that thruster jets up to number 156 be fired. I heard him. Rombo walked over to Chapman Jerome. Admiral, he said, I'm Lieutenant Ramba Rall of the Principality of Zeon's Secret Service. I regret to inform you that you're under arrest until given further notice. Until further notice. You can't arrest me, Lieutenant, Chapman said, smiling thinly at the tall young man. We're still carrying out our own investigation into the cause of the accident. He had been prepared for the fact that some eager beavers from the SS might arrive after the accident, but he felt secure in his own position. After all, he thought, he was protected by none other than the supreme commander of the Principality, Giran Zabi, 
who not once, not ever in his life, has shown a psychotic tendency. Ever. No siree Bob. He's never tried to have anyone close to him murdered before. No way! Chapman was naive. An aging officer, he had in effect placed himself in a situation where he could be used, and disposed of, at whim. With no powerful connections outside his organizational relationship to Gir and Zabi, he had no one to support him in case the relationship soured. Even Rambaral was better positioned than Chapman Jerome was. Ah, but as I understand it, sir, Ramba continued, you are the one who issued the order to change the angle of fire. Am I not right? You must be mad. Someone gave the order. Are you suggesting, sir, that it was not you, but one of your trusted lieutenants? Ramba looked around the room at the assembled men. He knew that in command centers, surveillance cameras normally recorded everything in triplicate, on videotapes and cards, and he ordered them played back. As he suspected, they contained useless noise. Hmm, he said, this appears to be the result of more than simple Minovsky interference. Chapman protested indignantly. Listen, Lieutenant, Rambaral, isn't it? What makes you think you have the authority to interrogate us like this anyway? Admiral, sir, I have been directly ordered to do so by His Excellency Supreme Commander Girin Zabi. You what? Instinctively, Chapman knew that he was doomed. Lieutenant Rambaral had been sent to destroy him. But, but I was issued the order from above, he sputtered. M my men here are witnesses. Uh, how dare you accuse me? Chapman never saw what was coming. Ramba's left hand moved with blinding speed, drawing an old-fashioned automatic pistol from his hip and firing a bullet through the admiral's forehead, spattering his brains out the other side. Ramba slowly slid the gun back into its holster. The mood in the command center turned to ice. "'The will of the Supreme Commander has been carried out!' he announced to the stunned crowd. For the time being, the guild will be under the direct command of the Secret Service. You shall all return to your current posts and await orders. Then he had one of his own men search the Admiral's pockets for the key to unlock the hotline vid phone. After listening to Ramba Rao's report on the hotline, Girin Zabi said, I'll send a special investigation team out immediately. As soon as they arrive, you can return to your regular duties. Then he hung up and reached for a cup of coffee sitting on a console in front of him. His scheme had worked beautifully. The accident had resulted in heavy losses of Xeon ships, but it was nothing compared to those of the Federation. Their entire armada appeared to have evaporated. The operations room at Joint Command Headquarters in Zoom City was suddenly bustling with activity. Military men rushed to check the displays used to monitor each battle zone, and as it became apparent that the Principality had achieved a resounding victory everywhere, the atmosphere turned party-like. Special food and drinks were delivered to all present. Here and there, curls of smoke rose from officers who had decided to sit back and enjoy a cigarette. Others continued to relay orders to the field, but did so in a relaxed, boisterous mood. Hurry up and contact the remaining Aboaku forces. Send scout ships out to monitor Federation supply lines. Tell all fleets from Solomon to demand the surrender of any fleeing Federation ships. Girin turned his back on the clamor. Hmph, he grumbled. I wonder what the Jabbero moles are going to say now. Then he turned to the comm officer in the room and in a loud voice ordered, I want a line to Jabbero kept open round the clock from now on. Yes, sir, the man replied with a smile. Then, as his staff officers cheered and saluted, Girin started striding toward the room exit. 
Because of the enthusiastic din on his way out, he missed hearing the shocked voice of another officer monitoring a comm line. What? You're from a Swamel, you say? You've captured three Federation ships? And you want to enter Zone City Port? The Zoom City port was on the shady end of the Mammoth Colony Cylinder. The sunny end... That's, that's shady as in it's actually shaded, not like, oh, well, you know, the port is on the shady end of the colony. <laughs> uh, I was like, wow, why is it the shady end? That seems whack. Why would, you, why would you have a dedicated end that's shady? Well, because it's literally in the shade. Okay. Sorry. The Zoom City port was on the shady end of the Mammoth Colony Cylinder. The sunny end was used primarily for agriculture and to collect solar energy for internal power requirements. The ships in Kaecilia Zabi's unit, deployed in a circle around the Pegasus II and its consorts, consorts? Shouldn't it be cohorts? were immediately ordered to, keep, to stop their engines and wait outside the port module, but they kept them idling and drifted on inertia toward the giant entry hatches. A special patrol vessel came out to inspect the new arrivals. On the Swammel, an intelligence officer turned to Kaecilia and reported, There are seven heavy cruisers in the area, one of which is now in port. A squadron from Mahal will arrive soon. A squadron from Mahal will arrive soon. Will arrive soon. There we go. Sorry. I'm having a hard time. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting lost in the sauce is what's happening. <laughs> After a moment's hesitation, Kaecilia decided to crush all resistance in Zum City immediately, before Giran could mobilize his forces and before other warships could arrive on the scene. We'll go with Plan 1, she announced. We'll force our way in. Then she turned and hurried from the bridge area to the Swamel's hangar where a red rickdom waited for her, its cockpit hatch open. Slightly behind and to the left of the pilot seat, she had ordered an auxiliary seat installed. Char would be the pilot, but, despite the personal risk, she would accompany him. She was determined to exact revenge, revenge on Girin Zabi herself. Ready? Char asked after she boarded. As was her custom before battle, Kaecilia unrolled the scarf-like collar around her neck and raised it up over her mouth. "'Take it away, Commander,' she said in a muffled but confident voice. "'Don't worry about me.' "'Ah, but I do,' Shar thought, knowing Kaecilia was too busy thinking about her brother to sense his true intent. The other MS pilots, including Leroy Gilliam, had positioned their suits on the upper deck of the Swamel and were waiting for Char to launch. Then the hangar doors opened and the red rickdom slipped into space, signaling the start of the entire operation. "'Think we can find him?' Kaecilia asked. "'Probably,' Char answered, turning his main engine on full thrust." In his rearview monitor, he saw three other Rickdoms and three Zakus follow him off the Swamel's decks. And then, from the Pegasus II, he saw the flare of an engine streak out of the hatch into black space, and knew it was Kai Shiden's gun cannon. The eight suits immediately assumed formation and plunged toward the Zum City Port Module. Zum City Port Module. There we go. Not the port module, not the module on the port side of... Z Never mind. The eight suits immediately assumed formation and plunged, and plunged toward the Zum City port module. And following them, with flames belching from their main engines, came the newly allied force of eight Xeon and Federation ships. The Swammel turned its main cannon on the port module and fired once. A white-hot light leapt from the barrel and directly hit the giant exterior hatch doors, piercing two layers. 
The doors suddenly swelled, flashed, and then blew up, spewing forth metal shrapnel toward the suits and ships, but they continued charging ahead. Kai kept his eyes on the red rickdom in front of him. He felt uneasy. He was the only one in the MS formation who knew nothing about Zum City. He just hoped Shar would lead them directly to Girin Zabi, wherever he was. When the suits arrived at the colony port, two layers of the hatch doors were intact, were still intact, so they fired bazooka shells and tried to blow the third wide open. The fourth door they would have to leave intact, since destroying it would cause far too much damage to the inside of Zum City Colony. While they were working on the hatch doors, the Swammel and the Pegasus II left the other ships to stand guard outside and entered the port area. Zeon ships loyal to Girin Zabi and in the Zum City area noticed something odd, but they failed to realize that a full-scale rebellion was underway because of the cover message constantly broadcast on all wavelengths by Kaecilia's forces. This is her excellent... Her excellent. This is Her Excellency Kaecilia Zabi's task force. This is not an insurrection, but an authorized military action. Any resistance will be crushed. This is Her Excellency Kaecilia Zabi's task force. <laughs> Kai was prepared to encounter several Xeon suits on guard inside the port module, and sure enough, while his new comrades busied themselves demolishing the remaining hatch doors, he put two out of action. In the meantime, Shar's Rickdom slipped through the hole in the third hatch door and reached the fourth and last. Guards on either side of the door began firing, but Shar apparently located the manual lever that opened it, for the top and bottom halves slowly began to recede into the walls. As soon as they had enough clearance, the team of eight suits dashed into the open space of the Zum City Colony, firing a f fighting a fierce gale from the escaping air. Behind them, when the giant doors opened fully, came the Swammel and the Pegasus too. As soon as it cleared, the Swammel immediately broadcast a warning to the port authorities and the joint and the joint As soon as it cleared, the Swammel immediately broadcast a warning to the port authorities and the Zeon Joint Command Headquarters. This is Her Excellency Kaecilia Zabi. You are ordered to close the fourth hatch immediately. We are henceforth occupying Zum City. We intend no harm to civilians. Any resistance will only cause needless suffering to the colony and its inhabitants. Cease all resistance. The MS unit quickly reformed and began descending from the port module toward the area where the government officials maintained their residences. Kai watched on his cockpit monitors as artificially generated clouds streamed by, and then to his astonishment saw a vast green plain. He knew it was completely man-made, but it was the first Earth-like environment he had seen in months, and he could hardly contain his delight. People lived here. They led normal lives. He thought about something Shar had said to the effect that the more artificial an environment, the more people deluded themselves into a sense of omnipotence, but he decided it wasn't true. Even if surrounded by a synthetic world, people tended to live and abide by the basic laws of real nature. He was an example himself, he thought with a touch of pride. But it was an issue he decided to shelve until later. He had to concentrate on where he was going. He had to concentrate on where he was going. The inside walls of the colony, the ground, had gravity generated by centrifugal force, so the middle of the cylinder was in a virtually weightless state. That made it easy to fly even in a machine with a humanoid configuration, but he had to be careful not to use too much power. They were inside one of the largest colony cylinders in the solar system, 30 kilometers wide and 150 kilometers long, but they still had limited room to maneuver. It was 6.30 in the morning, colony time, and certainly the first time any of the colony residents had ever seen a formation of eight huge mobile suits roaring over their heads. Thousands of civilians, mobilized for the war, were on their way to work, and when they looked up, they must have thought it was either a victory flyby or a sign of something terrible about to happen. 
Anyone detect anything? Shar said into his mic. In, <laughs> said into his mic to the MS formation. His voice was a little impatient, but it went over the radio channel loud and clear. There was almost no Minovsky interference. No, not yet, came a nervous reply from Leroy Gilliam. Kaecilia, seated next to Shar, said, He's got to be over by the joint he's got to be over at the Joint Command Headquarters, and checked the beam rifle by her side. Then Kai Shidan's voice nearly jumped from Shar's cockpit speaker. Got it! It's right in front of us. I sense a presence. Good work, gun cannon. Lead the way, Shar barked. And in response, Kai's suit immediately moved out in front of the formation, dropping faster and faster. He's a Federation pilot, isn't he? Kaecilia said, stating the obvious. Kai Shiden, a junior grade lieutenant, Shar told her. Following the formation of suits, the Swammel and Pegasus II surged through the, cl the cloud cover, carefully maintaining a constant altitude. In the proscribed space of the colony's cylinder, of the colony cylinder, their incongruous appearance alone was enough to discourage resistance. The Swammel was jet black with a beak-like prow and a round, tank-like stern. The Pegasus was a brilliant white, almost delicate structure that, true to its name, resembled a horse. To the colonists, who had never seen suits or ships inside their artificial environment, they seemed like apparitions from another world. Giran Zabi slipped his hand inside Cecilia Irene's blouse and fondled her ample left breast. But then she suddenly announced, Sir, your sister Caecilia's coming here. The teacup in his other hand began to shake, and he looked at her in shock. What? he choked. Did you say Caecilia? Yes, sir. Girin's fingers went into a spasm and clutched at her breast, but she didn't even flinch. She was terrified herself. She had awakened that morning and waited for Girin to return to his residence from the Joint Command Headquarters. As usual, they would have a cup of their favorite tea together, and then, while Girin catnapped in his study, she would monitor any emergency messages from headquarters. "'I don't know why, sir.' Cecilia said nervously, but I suddenly sensed her voice and felt that she was here. Maybe I'm hallucinating or something. What she didn't tell Girin was that she had actually heard a voice, a thought from Caecilia saying, I'm going to kill him. Girin finally came to his senses. Ha! Ah, some hallucination. Even Caecilia couldn't pull off a stunt like that. Then, noticing his hand still on Cecilia's breast, he squeezed the mound of flesh even harder. "'Please, sir,' she said, wincing. A comm monitor in the room flickered to life, and over an image of panicking staff officers at the Joint Command Headquarters, Girin heard an announcement. Uh, "'Sir, the Zumport area has just been bombarded by the Swammel. We appear to have an insurrection on our hands.' Cecilia had been right. Girin commanded with his most authoritative voice into a microphone. Keep updating me as more information comes in. Then, leaving the monitor on, he walked back over to Cecilia. She quickly stood up and draped his jacket over his shoulders. He reached out and gently touched her left nipple through her blouse. One of his great strengths was his ability to quickly reconcile himself to a new situation. Sorry, Cecilia, he said. Then he added, I wonder what my horoscope would say now. I wish I knew, she replied, with as much empathy as possible. In the background, on the monitor, they could both hear an official-sounding voice continuing to relay information. The fourth, the fourth hatch door in the port module has been breached. A squadron of mobile suits appears to have entered the colony. We need information on their number. Immediately. 
Girin left his study and headed for the front door of his residence. This just shows I made the right decision, he thought. Caecilia couldn't be trusted. That's why I had to get rid of her. In front of the building, an Elicar limousine with a chauffeur and staff officer was waiting for him. He climbed in the back seat and barked, Take me to the Joint Command Headquarters immediately. Then he turned to the officer in front of him and demanded, What sort of defense have we sent up? The officer, receiver in hand, never took his eyes off a small monitor on the dashboard in front of him. We've ordered our troops into action, sir, he replied. How many enemy suits are there? Looks like seven or eight, sir. The Swamel's already infiltrated into the colony interior, and we have reports it's accompanied by a Federation white base class ship, the one our men call the Trojan Horse. You mean the one that's supposed to be carrying their new type unit? Just then, the staff officer suddenly exclaimed into his receiver, What? You say the Red Comet's with him? Instantly, Girin knew. Shar Asnabal, Kaecilia, the Federation new types. It could mean only one thing. Now that the Earth Federation forces were on their last legs, and the Principality had badly depleted its military strength, Kaecilia had decided to use every means at her disposal to eliminate him in a full-scale coup d'etat. As his limousine sped down the highway at full speed, he thought, Kaecilia, you're worse than I am. In the midst of chaos and confusion, Kai Shiden detected Girin's presence. Just as Amaral Ray had once detected Dozel Zabi's aura, it appeared to Kai as a swirling black psychic mist. I see it! he exclaimed inside his cockpit. I see it! Just like Amaro said! He almost thought he heard a voice, Amaro's voice, reply calmly, congratulating him. Below him, he could see an unescorted limousine barreling down a six-lane highway, scattering civilian elecars on their way to work before it. He fired his retro rockets and put his gun cannon down on the road a hundred meters in front of the limousine, landing on the asphalt with a thud and creating huge cracks in the road. Then the seven other suits of the combined MS unit landed around him. Together, they completely blocked the road. Girin Zabi's driver screamed as he slammed on the brakes of the limousine. Girin craned his neck out the window, saw the suits, and instantly realized he was surrounded. Then he heard the amplified voice of his sister Kaecilia emerge from a red rickdom to the left. Supreme Commander Girin Zabi, get out of your elecar! The Rickdom held a beam bazooka in its right hand, and its sights were trained on his limousine. Directly in front of him was another red suit of slightly different design. The, the Red Comet? Girin sputtered in disbelief. The humiliation of having eight mobile suits peering down at him was too much to bear. He knew there was no way to escape, but in a rage he opened the right-hand door of the limousine and stepped out. The Rick Dom's mono-eye glowered ominously down at him. The suit directly in front, he suddenly realized, was a Federation suit, proudly wearing its scratches and dents the way a seasoned warrior bore his scars. On the main monitor of Kai's gun cannon, the supreme commander of the Principality of Zeon looked like a dwarf. To Kai, somehow everything suddenly seemed anticlimactic, but, he reflected, that was probably the way things were supposed to be. Then the red rickdom next to him moved its left hand horizontally around to the cockpit hatch. The hatch opened, and Kaecilia Zabi stepped out onto the suit's open palm, carrying a beam rifle. 
The hand gently lowered her to waist level so she could better confront Girin, but she was still nine meters off the ground. Behind the curtain of suits, Ella cars belonging to the Principality military and equipped with wire-guided missiles began to collect, but when they saw that their supreme commander was being held hostage at gunpoint, they were forced to watch, helpless. Seconds later, several hundred armed soldiers also arrived on the scene from the Joint Command Headquarters half a kilometer away, but they, too, became mere spectators at the standoff. Kaecilia, Girin called out. What are you trying to do? Kaecilia had her mask drawn up over her chin. The same thing you tried to do to me, brother. You tried to kill me, she answered. How do you know that? Ever hear of Lieutenant Rambaral and Crowley Hammon? she said, training her gun on his private parts. Girin sputtered in disbelief, but at the same moment Kaecilia fired. Girin took the full blast of the beam, and his body disintegrated before he even had time to cry out. Well, that's that, Kaecilia said coolly. Then Shar suddenly flicked the Rickdom's left wrist, and Kaecilia flew through the air, her finger still on the beam rifle trigger. Shar! she screamed, as her body fell with a thud on the scorched asphalt beside Girin's limousine. A few fragments of Girin's seared flesh, scattered high into the air, fell on top of her. Then it was all over. Char's red rickdom spun around and headed toward the Joint Command Headquarters, striding down the asphalt road past Kai's gun cannon. Kai stared at the back of the rickdom. Then he stared at Kaecilia. Her body lay motionless, trails of purple smoke rising in the air around her from where her beam rifle had scorched the pavement. How easily people die, he thought. In the sky above, Pegasus II and the Swammel approached with guns trained threateningly on the Joint Command Headquarters. Shar, in his rickdom, had arrived on the steps of the building and appeared to be delivering some sort of speech to the troops there, but Kai couldn't hear what he was saying. Amaro, he thought, this is the way it turned out. Suddenly, he realized that he hated Shar Asnabal. The surf frothed around Sela's bare feet. It was both white and transparent at the same time, and it felt warm. The southern European sun was getting stronger, and soon would bring all the delights of summer. Her blonde hair, wet from the tidal air, rustled against her shoulders. On Zeon, Degwin Zabi had been dethroned. The Principality had reverted to a rep to a republic with Prime Minister Darcia Bakarov at its helm, and a peace treaty had been concluded with the Earth Federation government. The Pegasus II and its two consorts had been seized by Zeon forces, and nearly half the crews had voluntarily taken Zeon citizenship. Shar Aznable remained in the Zeon military as a captain, helping in its reconstruction, and he was joined by Bright Noah, Mirai Yashima, and several dozen other members of the Pegasus II crew. Kai Shiden was not among them. He stayed with the Earth Federation forces. Luna II was placed under the jurisdiction of the Republic of Zeon, and Fra Bo and her three charges lived peacefully thereafter. Only Sela Mass chose to return to Earth, to the place she had once lived. When she left, Shar had said, I'm staying here, but I'm not in it just for Zeon, Sela. It's a lot bigger than that. Amaro was ahead of his time, and my work isn't over yet. On Earth, Sela began living a normal, uneventful life. As far as she was concerned, her brother Kasval Dekun no longer existed. 
People in space continue to look down on those who chose to remain in the ravaged environment of Earth, and derisively called them moles, but she didn't care. She finally felt rested, as if after a long fatigue. It was early summer, the most peaceful and beautiful time in the Mediterranean. Wanna go swimming, sailor? She slowly lowered her naked young body into the surf. A wave swelled over her, and she was surrounded by indigo blue. Amaro was gone, but he was with her. She began swimming with bold strokes, alone. And that was the Mobile Suit Gundam novelization by Yoshiyuki Tomino. The end of the final volume, Confrontation. Uh, that last quote from Amaro is using the um, twin V brackets. I forget what those are called. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since I had <laughs> me... Um, it's in italics for starters, but it's also, uh, I'm going to post this into the stream chat so nobody will see it. Um, looks something like that, which is to indicate that it's new type mind communication stuff. Not actual telepathy, but... Uh, New type, mind communication. Might as well be telepathy, but still. So, there is an afterword here, uh, which I'm going to read as well. Um, it's not very long, it's only a couple pages. Also gives me an excuse to do this. Afterword. A word from the translator. Yoshiyuki Tomino's original trilogy of the Mobile Suit Gundam novels has stood the test of time. Boosted by the huge success of the ever-expanding multimedia Gundam universe, the books have remained popular in Japan since their initial publication in 1979. They were Tomino's first foray into the world of novels, and it helped him not only express a different, more fleshed-out version of the original Gundam story, but also launch a side career, in addition to that of anime director, as a popular science fiction and fantasy novelist. This English-language translation of the original Gundam trilogy first appeared in the United States between 1990 and 91. It was originally issued by Ballantine Books, a subsidiary of the giant publisher Random House, under their popular Del Rey imprint. Prior to Gundam, Ballantine had also previously issued the Star Wars and Robotech line of novels, the latter based on the popular Robotech TV series, which was in turn extremely loosely based on multiple Japanese TV anime series. Both of these series had been very successful, in part because they were supported by the huge name recognition of the properties themselves, and by the exposure that had been generated in advance by movies and sales of merchandise, etc. I was first approached to translate the Gundam series around 1988 by a veteran sci-fi editor at Ballantine. As I recall, she had learned of me from people at Lucasfilm, where I sometimes worked as an interpreter, and also from my non-fiction books on manga and Japanese robotics. She was clearly looking for something that would fit with her company's line of Star Wars and Robotech books, and, on hearing about the huge Gundam phenomenon in Japan, thought Mr. Tomino's novels would be ideal candidates. Although honored to be asked, I was at first reluctant to work on such a huge project, particularly since the publisher's expectations of the translator seemed particularly high, and an almost literal translation was demanded. But I liked the story, and felt that it could be faithfully rendered into English and still work as a novel, which is not always the case with Japanese popular literature. 
Mr. Tomino wrote the Gundam novels in a fairly elaborate style, but in retrospect, my biggest problem was not translating the meaning of his prose. Rather, it was figuring out what to do with his made-up terminology, since for his complex sci-fi saga, he had to invent scores of names for people and places in Mecca. These names were mostly rendered in a Japanese phonetic script called katakana, usually used for foreign words, but they had no fixed English spellings because the original readers were, obviously, all Japanese. I therefore had to transliterate them into English to assign them spellings. This in itself was not particularly difficult, but there was a somewhat amusing political aspect to the problem. With the success of Gundam merchandise in Japan, some local designers of plastic model kits and other items had already rendered many of the story's terms in English. Unfortunately, however, they had often done so with little regard for the spellings or sound, since they had little knowledge of English and were mainly trying to achieve an artistic effect. As a result, in the early days in Japan, some English spellings of the terminology were rather unorthodox, if not awkward, and often there were multiple variants of the same terms. And around the same time, even before the Gundam videos and films and merchandise became officially available in the United States, a small group of dedicated fans there had already emerged. They, too, had begun to transliterate the story's complicated terminology using their own preferred spellings, but, like the designers in Japan, they had no way of enforcing any unity outside their own small group. In both, in both Japan and the United States, therefore, Gundam spellings were in considerable disarray. Thus, the rebel nation pronounced Jion in Japanese was variously spelled in English-language articles or advertisements as Zion, Jion, Zion with an X, and so forth. I therefore went back to the original Japanese and tried to come up with spellings which I felt, one, sounded like the original and reflected the author's intent, two, enhanced rather than detracted from the mood of the story, and three, would be acceptable to American readers unfamiliar with the animation. Thus, I spelled Zion as Zion, because Z has strong overtones. Think of all the Zs used in U.S. muscle car names. Zion was unacceptable, because some readers might think Mr. Tomino is making a religious statement when he is not. I'm mispronouncing that. It's, it still would be pronounced the same way, but it's Z-I-O-N, like Zionism. The antagonist of the story, whose name is pronounced in Japanese as Sha Asunaburu, I rendered as Sha Asnable, S-H-A Asnable. I had seen this spelled variously as Char Asnable, or even Char Asnavor, but Char Asnavor didn't sound at all like the original Japanese. To me, it also had odd overtones of charcoal and charwoman, etc., and seemed too close to the French chanson singer Charles Asnavor. I had no way of predicting it, but by the time I finally finished work on the series in 1991, the number of North American Gundam anime fans attached to specific spellings, especially to Char, had grown considerably. One email I received from an irate American fan, and early user of the internet, opened with, I eagerly awaited the release of Gundam and literally rushed out to buy the book. I must say you ruined my whole day. Your decision to change the names of the characters, chiefly Shar, left me with a single question. Why? The English Gundam novels have now been out of print for over a decade. When first issued, they appeared with no advertising and promotion and almost no name recognition. Sales, while stellar by the standards of a small publisher, were not, it is safe to say, what Ballantine had probably expected. But in the 14 years since the books first appeared, Gundam anime and merchandise have begun to appear in volume in the United States, with the result that the environment for these novels has changed radically. There is an exponentially larger fan community and market for English-language Gundam material than there was in 1990. As a result, more and more fans have recently been asking about the translated trilogy, despite the fact that, or perhaps partly because of it, it has a shockingly different ending than the animation with which, they are most, with which most are familiar. 
After long and arduous negotiations with both Ballantine and the Japanese rights holders, it has finally become possible for Stonebridge Press to reissue my translation in this new single-volume format. At the same time, in recognition of the fact that they control a now-huge global entertainment property, the rights holders in Japan have finally created a unified list of English spellings of the characters and mecha for all animation and merchandise sold overseas. Therefore, although Mr. Tomino's trilogy should ideally be read as a story independent from the animation series, for this edition I have gone back and changed the names of familiar characters and mecha to make them conform to now official English spellings for the animated story. I have retained my original transliterations only when the characters and mecha are unique to the novels and do not also appear in animation or other formats. In addition, I have taken the opportunity to smooth out the now quite old original translation in a few places. I hope the result will allow modern readers the opportunity to enjoy Mr. Tomino's novels as they are supposed to be enjoyed, as pure entertainment. In conclusion, I would like to give a tip of my hat, a tip of the hat to Mark Simmons for reading over my translation manuscript, and especially to Yoshiyuki Tomino and Yasuo Watanabe of Sunrise Incorporated for their support and encouragement in making this republication possible. Frederick L. Schott, San Francisco, April 2004 Alrighty, uh, that about does it. I uh, hope people dug it. Um, sorry that I'm doing this on Wednesday instead of uh, next Monday. Um, I'm not going to be here next Monday. I'm going to be out and about. I'm going to... Something I had forgotten about. <clears throat> um, and was like, oh, well, even though I forgot about it, I might be able to get it done real quickly. No, I'm not going to be able to get it done real quickly. That's going to be an all-day affair. But that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um... With that said, um, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Hope people dug it. Um, I realize parts of it were a little rough. Uh, the reason they're a little rough is because uh, I do this live <laughs> every uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, except for the ones that I can't make it to, like next coming Monday, um, starting at about noon Eastern Standard Time, um, U.S. East Coast Time. Uh, yeah. So feel free to tune in on those to get more readings of different material. Um, Mondays I typically have reserved for Mecca Mondays. Um, <laughs> so next week I won't have one, but the week after I'll figure out what I'm going to do. Um, when I say Mecca, I mean uh, giant robot related or Mecca adjacent. So powered armor counts. Um, It'll probably be my excuse to do military sci-fi, basically, because um, there's a lot of overlap there. That and cyberpunk stuff. Um, suffice it to say, though, there is a very long laundry list of things uh, that I have queued up uh, for for doing on Mecha Mondays. So as niche as that genre sounds, it's it's there's still a pretty hefty bevy of uh, of material. Um, no, I won't be reading Ready Player One or Two by Ernest Cline, because I have very little respect for Ernest Cline, and far less respect for Ready Player One. <laughs> um, strong opinion, maybe not well-beloved, but... Uh, or well-regarded, rather, but uh, I have a very low opinion of Ready Player One. Um, if I wanted to read a laundry list of uh, nostalgia bait from Wikipedia, copy-pasted almost whole cloth from Wikipedia, I would make that book myself. I am not that much of a hack, however, so I don't. Also, I'm not a creative type, and I'm extremely lazy. So, um, that's off. <laughs> Uh, I much sooner do Starship Troopers, warts and all, uh, than I do that. Um, and Starship Troopers is kind of a... Uh, it's its amazing to me how upset and worked up people get on both sides of an ideological divide over Starship Troopers. And I'm reading it. And anytime I read through, I'm like, yeah, it's a fun story. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting view to a future. It's an interesting sci-fi tale. 
uh, why is everyone getting really, really excited? It's, it's like, oh, well, it's because Heinlein wanted people to become military fascists. And I'm like, did he, though? Could he not be saying, here's something you have to worry about if you have a military meritocracy running the show? A theoretically meritoc theoretical meritocracy running the show, where citizenship is not guaranteed unless you have military service. Hmm. Wouldn't they want to then, therefore, keep ensuring that the military was still around and relevant? Hmm. They might do that. I wonder if that means they would start a war. Gosh golly gee willikers. Um, and then on the other hand, where it's like, oh, well, it's not actually fascism. And it's like, well, <laughs> it's definitely pretty authoritarian, though. <laughs> like, you don't have a vote unless you're part of the system sort of thing. Uh, and therefore, you know, your goals at that point become slightly different. Anyway. Uh, it's also one of the formative uh, power armor uh, novels, so it's it's on the list. Um, without Starship Troopers, Mobile Suit Gundam probably doesn't exist. Uh, this isn't to say that Starship Troopers is the first instance of powered armor ever. Um, there might be one earlier than Lensman, but Lensman is the one I generally think of as being like number one, and I think it's in it's either in Grey Lensman or Galactic Patrol, and I can't remember which. I think it might be Galactic Patrol. Um no, I mean uh Grey Lensman rather, sorry. I think it might be Grey Lensman, uh where the protagonist of that series winds up building a um a suit of armor that allows him to have the strength of ten men or something similar. Um not that he needs it because he's like a psychic murder machine Uber mention. Um, who's been trained by, like, space gods. It's wild. Like, I'd love to read the Lensman series, but other people have read it before me, and um, frankly, I think they probably would do it better than I would, but I still kind of want to do it anyway. This is not to take away from the work of the uh, inestimable Reed McCollum of, uh, oh, what was... I think it was Books in Motion from Spokane, Washington. Yes, I'm remembering that correctly. This may come as a shock, but I don't actually listen to many books on tape. <laughs> That's one book series that I did, and it is worth. It was very good. Well worth looking for if you can find it. Um, I don't know when that was published, though, so it, I might be totally safe to do it. I know some of the Lensman series is... Uh, I know Triplanetary is uh, fair use at this point. Um, I don't know about the rest. I could double check on Project Gutenberg to see. I know Triplanetary is on there. They might have First Lensman as well. I'd have to find out. Um, I do want to get around to that at some point. Um, they're very pulpy. Uh, I think parts of them have not uh, stood the test of time. I think other parts have. Um, I think the writing style is probably the hardest part. <laughs> to get through. Uh, what I'm probably going to do next, though, is um, either the first Robotech novelization, um, if we want to do something moderately cringeworthy, or the first uh, volume of the translation of the Full Metal Panic uh, novel series. Uh, which is cringeworthy for different reasons. It's a rom-com. <laughs> it's it happens to have some great action scenes and giant robots, but it's it's also definitely a rom-com, and that's a little outside my uh, my bailiwick normally. But giant robots are very much inside, so you you, you get me. Um, when I say cringeworthy about Robotech, the the actual books themselves are pretty good for the most part. Um, they get complicated they, they, they get worse <laughs> uh like so after they run out of um show based material so robotech uh so back in the 80s um a company called harmony gold uh, which i believe was still under the leadership of one frank agrama who is um him and Haim saban are like really bad dudes uh, <laughs> these these people have have uh, uh, 
are are not high on my list in terms of personages. But um, basically, back in the eighties, uh, Harmony Gold uh, proceeded to get the licensing uh, to do an adaptation of uh, three separate series, Super Dimension Fortress Macross, uh, Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, and uh, Genesis Climber Mospita. And they localized them all as Robotech and then tried to say, hey, these are all part of all one series, even though they're clearly not. Um, and the lengths they go to to make that happen are pretty silly. Suffice it to say, the novelizations are actually pretty good. But once they run out of material that had been animated, um, they kept making novels. And they go off the deep end fairly quickly and not in a good way. They jump the shark and there are a lot of them. I'm not going to touch on... I'm probably not going to touch on any beyond the... Uh, I think all the ones after the series are collectively known as the Shadow Chronicles. Um, I'd have to double-check. I don't know what they're all called now anymore. Um, I don't remember the titles of the individual ones that come after, but there's like 20 of them. It's wild how many there are. Um, there might not actually be 20. I don't remember how many there are, but there's a lot. There's too many. Uh, but... Uh, the only ones I'd be interested on do, in doing on stream would be the ones for uh, the section of Robotech that covered the uh, Macross portion, the Super Dimension Fortress Macross portion. Partly so that I can spit in the eye of Harmony Gold, and partly because it's honestly probably the best portion of the lot. It's before they have to start bending over backwards to make separate series adhere to a broader canon that they simply don't. <laughs> So that's that's a possibility and also full metal panic, but it kind of depends on how I'm feeling the Monday after next, because I have no idea. I might not even be awake that Monday. I might be traveling uh, through space and time, you know, as a disembodied new type ghost. My soul no longer bound down by gravity. That'd be an experience. Um, hopefully I wouldn't have to die to make that happen. At any rate, uh, Wednesdays are my float days. I do whatever. I don't know what I'm doing next Wednesday. Something I do want to do, though, is there's a there's a couple books I do want to read, and that might change the title of Wordy Wednesdays a bit. Uh, we'll see if we do that next Wednesday or not. Um, and then Fridays are free read Fridays, uh, where I read short stories and, indeed, entire novels aloud. Um, it's the OG, and right now we're reading through the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons. Uh, we are in we're about three quarters of the way through the series at this point, uh, the duology anyway, of Hyperion and the fall of Hyperion. So uh, things are going to be real exciting this Friday. I'm, I'm really hyped. Um, and you should be too, because I said so. And what I say goes, right? Because I definitely don't have solipsism. I'm not a megalomaniac. So y'all do what you're going to do. Um, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, thanks to everyone who's watching these after the fact. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hope you enjoyed. Um, if you're still listening to all this blathering afterwards, I'm not really sure why. <laughs> uh, we freestyle it here, and sometimes I say some shit I really regret. I'm like, oh, I didn't really mean that, actually. Oh, boy, that phrasing is not nice. I don't often listen to these, though, so uh, I th it's, it's the sort of stuff that wakes me up at night. I'm like, oh, you really said that, didn't you? You're an idiot. And I'm like, don't call yourself an idiot. It's not productive. I'm like, yeah, it was pretty dumb. I'm like, eh, shut up. Yes, I have conversations with myself. Why are you asking? More things that I'm going to regret saying. Cool. Anyway, no schizophrenia here. At any rate. Um, yeah, that's going to do it. Uh, see you all later. Uh, stay safe, stay sane, and uh, be decent to each other. Have a good one. It's what Amaro would have wanted. So you can become a new type of person. Expand your consciousness, man. Alrighty. I'm going to go. Bye.